It's some scary stories on your psp. I mean, not in the US. This only came out in Japan because, just like with Echo Knight, the first voyage, uh, this is the Haunted Zone. This was from on a FromSoft's Adventure Player, another one of the games that came with it. Uh, this one, unlike Echo Knight, this one is just uh, text stories. Horror stories in text form. We have a little some graphics and some audio, but uh, we have some spooky tales that I hope make you very afraid. Yeah, it's a good thing we're streaming it and not playing it on a real PSP, because clearly if this was on a real PSP, uh, you might get so afraid you might drop the PISP, and those are expensive, you know? You don't want to break it. So it's kind of um, hazardous to have played this on the real hardware. We're going to get started with a Tale 1, The Cramped Elevator. That is very frightening. It would, be, it, would be, it would be even more frightening if this was not a supernatural story, if this was just getting onto an elevator and there are too many people on it, and the elevator breaks and stops. That would be a very frightening thing. You know, there's something to be said about mundane horror. Horror doesn't always have to be about ghosts and demons. It can just be about, oh no, I am trapped in an elevator with way too many people, and I don't know when I'm getting out. You know, that's just a, just, just, just a thought. Just a thought. I think this is going to be more traditional horror. Well, let's get going with the cramped elevator. Begin. I had returned home late as usual. I looked at my watch. It was past midnight already. Everyone in the apartment had turned off the lights. It was like nobody was there. I pressed the button to call the elevator. It was on the B1 floor, but it moved up right away. The elevator doors opened. Someone else was already in the elevator. It was a lady with long hair. She was staring down at the ground, facing the wall. Even though the elevator doors had opened, she didn't turn to face me. The apartment building was 13 stories tall. I had no intention of going up the stairs. I mean, you could. That's not, not even really that big of a deal, if you ask me. The elevator was small, with an area of 4 meters, or roughly 13 feet. I hesitated about getting in with such an odd lady, but I figured I had no choice. I didn't look at her. I pushed the 13F button, then reached for the close button. That's when it hit me. The 13F button was the only one that had been pushed. None of the other buttons were lit. Where was this lady going? Facing the walls with her eyes cast down like that. When did she even get onto this elevator? Did she get on from the B1 floor, just as I called it? Was the elevator already moving when I pressed the button to call it to the first floor? There was one other thing I noticed as my hand reached for the close button. Another strange thing. Part of the wallpaper was peeling off, and I could see something behind it. There were letters that looked like they'd been scratched into the wall. Don't turn around. I mean, who, someone obviously put that in many years ago. We don't have to pay attention to that. That's, that has nothing to do with our current situation. The door closed just as I noticed the letters. The elevator started moving to the top floor. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. It was freaking me out. I decided that I wasn't going to turn around. I just keep looking forward until I reach the 13th floor. Nothing like this had ever happened to me. 2F. 3F. The elevator kept going up. I focused on the floor display, but I felt so unsettled. I couldn't help but think about the lady behind me. Just as we passed the fourth floor, or the fourth floor, I heard a sound from behind me. You know what four means. I focused on the windows of the elevator doors. Between floors, the wall was black, so I could see the reflection of what was happening behind me then. 
The lady's head had been pressed against the wall, but she slowly turned to face me. I couldn't see the expression on her face. Her long hair kept it hidden. I looked away, back at the floor display. We're still only at the sixth floor. I heard her take a step. Looking at her reflection in the window, I could see that she was stepping right up to me. In a few steps, she'd be standing side by side. Here in the small elevator, there was nowhere to run. The last time I looked at the floor display, it said 10F. Her footsteps stopped right behind me. I could see her face reflected in the window now. Her eyes met mine. She kept looking at me with a stoic expression and slowly stretched out her hands. Her hands passed over my shoulders as she reached her arms over from behind me. It sounds like she just wants a hug. I don't know. It's a little, un it's a little unusual. A little kind of breaking the social contract to hug a stranger in the elevator. But, you know, sometimes you just have to take physical contact where you can get it. You can't be choosy about that. Maybe... You've all heard the song, Love in an Elevator, living it up as we're going down. I mean, this time we're going up to the 13th floor. But I mean, maybe that maybe that's the situation. We're going to move on. Okay, we have a choice. This is a choose our own adventure. Do we turn back and shake off her arms? Or do we not look back no matter what? Well, uh, it's an unusual situation. But the words on the elevator did say, don't look back, right? And I mean, I guess we have to follow what they said. I guess we should, I guess we shouldn't look back. We reached the 13th floor. The elevator doors opened, so I flew right out. I no longer felt her presence behind me. I slowly turned around and looked back into the elevator. Nobody was there. I got back into the elevator to confirm she was gone. There was no trace of her. But the strange thing is, the letters that had been scratched into the wall were nowhere to be seen. The wallpaper was set perfectly in place. Was I imagining all of that? What just happened to me? I peeled at the wallpaper where the letters had been scratched, tearing it back again. Don't turn around. The letters were still there. Scratched into the wall by who knows what. The end. And that's that's our story of almost being hugged in an elevator. But we refused physical contact. We refused it. And well, I mean, that's how that's just how many contacts with the supernatural goes, right? It's like happens for a few seconds and then it's done. It's gone. I mean, obviously, if contact lasted longer than that, then there would be, you know, many documented cases of meeting the meeting the ghosts but that doesn't happen very long it happens real fast you might try to get your phone out to take a picture but they're out of there they get out real fast let's uh let's try the story again and try the other choice yeah we can just kind of actually skip through these here she come All right, so we're going to ignore what the message said. We're going to turn back and shake off her arms. We arrived at the 13th floor. I shook off her arms at that moment. Nobody was there. She had to have been there the whole time, but she wasn't there now. I'd seen her reflection the whole way up. I heard her footsteps clearly. Behind me, I could hear the door close. She was standing outside the elevator now. Lit by the lights out there, I could see her face. She was smiling. I pressed the door to open the elevator. It wouldn't open. The elevator started to go down. I tried pressing all of the buttons, but the elevator wouldn't respond. Now, we'll trade places, okay? I heard her say to me. The elevator continued going down. The end. Oh no, now we're a ghost trapped on the elevator. The elevator needs a ghost, I guess. And you gotta, if you want to get off, I guess you're gonna have to switch places with someone. So, uh, you can get off and they're gonna be stuck on there too. And, uh, I guess now it is our doom to wait for someone to get on the elevator, then we try to hug them. And hopefully they turn around so then we can switch places with them. 
Uh, that's, you know, sometimes you get into the haunted, you get into an elevator, you end up in the haunted zone, and then you, you could just st be there forever if you play your cards wrong. You gotta play them right. And when I say right, I mean see that the wall says not to turn around, and then you don't do it. I don't know who, t who I don't know who, who scratched that in the wall. I don't think the, the woman would have, because she wanted us to turn around. Clearly someone who had, someone else, who had knowledge of the haunted zone. But who could say who? I mean, that's the, that's the case with many haunted stories. Many elements of the unknown. We'll never know. Just like it's real life. That's just real life right there. You just never know. That's what makes it so scary. Well, that's... Tale 1 of 3, The Cramped Elevator. Tale... T whoops. Tale 2, No Refunds, No Returns. Uh-oh. The horror of, uh... Retail? I guess. Begin. I've recently started bidding in internet auctions. After entering college, I found myself a part-time job, and I've been wanting to do something fun with the extra money I had to spend. When I got home from work that day, I headed to the computer and turned it on. I had my eyes on a Polaroid camera. We're going to be holding a party to welcome new students, and some someone suggested doing a photo registry of the people who'd attend. Wow, when does this take place? Um... I mean, I was still buying a, a film Polaroid camera. I mean, I guess, considering when this came out, like your cell phone, uh, you know, cameras and cell phones existed, but I get they were kind of lousy at that point in time. So, I mean, maybe. Maybe you would have still wanted to have bought something like a Polaroid. You might wonder... Okay, here, they're, they're actually explaining that. You might wonder why I buy a Polaroid camera in the time when digital cameras are so prevalent. Well, it's because they don't save any data. Girls I'm meeting for the first time might not feel comfortable letting me save their picture. So one of my classmates is just a Polaroid camera. I guess that makes sense? I guess? Look, we all know girls feel very uncomfortable if you take their picture in a digital format because they're worried that you're trapping their soul uh, in the solid state memory. Like their their brain cells are going to be infused in the pixels in the phone. They believe that. Um, so they're very uncomfortable when you try to take their picture with a phone. But if you try to use a Polaroid camera, they're completely okay with it because that does not have that effect. Uh, not many people know this. But, if you want to get lucky with the ladies, you want a film camera. We drew lots to decide who would get it. That was also his suggestion. Plus, there was something more familiar and impactful about this sort of photo. Muscle memory kicked in, and with a click of the mouse, I opened the usual webpage. You know which one. You know what I'm talking about. The usual. The huge. I made the obvious entry into the search, into the siege bar, and... Voila! Over a hundred product results were lined up. No, I didn't know all that much about cameras. I figured that as long as it can take a photo, it should be fine. I started looking at the results starting from the top. Maybe we should try to educate ourselves on the subject of cameras. If we're, we're going to buy one off of the usual website. Sounds like we don't know anything about them. Man, that looks old. Even for the time this game came out, that looks real old. Used in pristine condition. No scratches or smudges. No refunds. No returns. It's not a haunted camera, is it? Because if, if, I, if I spend my hard-earned money that I earned from my part-time job on a camera, and it turns out it's haunted, would it be upset? What it caught my eye was an antique camera. Okay, so it is acknowledging that this is, this is an old camera. I liked the quirky design, and the bid was currently at exactly 1,000 yen. The fact that the seller had no history of transactions gave me pause, but... 
The cost was only about the same as a reasonably priced lunch, so I made a bid. But I mean, you can't eat a camera. You can't eat a camera. You should not try. The next day, I received an email that I had made the winning bid. The doorbell rang. My classmate, who had come over to visit, got the door for me, and he even stamped the receipt for the delivery. He said he needed to check the camera because he was worried that any camera I chose might not be all that great. But the truth is, he just loved cameras and was curious about it. Look, man, it was your decision that we would draw lots to decide who was buying this camera. Now, if you're going to come in here and trash my ability to buy a decent camera, you should have just done it yourself. Instead of waiting for me to do it and then saying you have to examine the camera to make sure I didn't screw it up. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. He opened it quickly, too. After ripping it out of the box, he unwrapped the camera itself. He said the name of the camera out loud, along with some letters and numbers, as he happily held it in his hands. As he stroked it, as he caressed it, as he was trying to shove it in his pants, but I said, no, that's my camera. There's only one pair of pants that's going into. I didn't know anything about cameras, personally. But what really caught my attention wasn't my classmate geeking out over the camera. As I moved to clean away the box, I noticed that a single photo had fallen out. The photo seemed like it had been placed in the package with the camera. It looked like it was about a decade old, with a woman holding some fireworks and a guy standing in front of her. Did the previous owner include the photo intentionally before sending it? I considered the possibility as I carefully picked up the photograph. Huh? There was something odd about the photo. The girl was colorful, lit up by the fireworks she was holding, yet the man she was with looked abnormally pale. I mean, he looked like a corpse. Well, come on now. Be, be polite. He's very, he's very fair-skinned. Doesn't mean he's a corpse. My classmate was paying no attention to me as he fiddled with the camera. Oh, it's got film in it! He pointed the camera at me and then... Ow! It's hot! I threw the photo down as if my fingers had just touched fire. He looked at me with a weird expression on his face. Hey! What happened? I'm certain it was hot, but... When I looked at the picture, I gasped! <gasps> there was a gasp. The guy had vanished. Up until now, the picture had shown me the pale face of some, some young man. Was I just imagining things? Maybe I only thought I saw him. But wait. The more I thought about it, the more my pulse started to pound. My classmate pointed the camera at me. Didn't you already try it out? Haven't you done enough? Stop wasting my film. Something felt off. I reached out to stop him, and that's when I felt something behind me. Uh-oh, here's our choice. Do we stop him? Or do we turn around? Well, we know from the first story, we probably should not turn around. And that's just how it is with ghosts. You, just, you should not turn around to face the ghost. Uh, so we probably should stop him from taking a picture. So do it. did I make good choose or bad choose? Let's find out. I plucked the camera out of his hands and stuck it back into the packing material. Hey, what gives? What did you do that for? He looked at me, disappointed. With the camera still in hand, I looked behind me. Nobody was there. As I finally breathed out, <sighs> he stood up. I'm going home. Clearly, his feelings were hurt. Without saying much, he got his stuff together. Uh, hey. I spoke up because I felt guilty. I didn't want him to be mad at me. That or I was afraid and trying to protect myself. Maybe it was a little of both. Please, take the camera with you, I said to him. I knew I should have told him about the photo, but I couldn't bring myself to say the words. He didn't react at first. I told him I just didn't know much about cameras, and when he heard that, he took the camera. His mood seemed to have lightened up. 
days later, I got a phone call from one of my other friends in my, that same class. They told me that my classmate had been hit by a car. I felt like my heart was going to jump out of my chest. I knew something was up once I saw that photo. Somehow, I could tell. I knew something bad was going to happen. But now, with the worst case scenario staring me straight in the face, there was no way I could sit back calmly and not panic. I thought I should take another look at the email that I had received from the seller, so I turned the computer on. It was gone. There was nothing to indicate that it had been deleted, but the sender's email was nowhere to be found. What was going on here? I had thrown away the photograph along with the packaging too. It all felt like some kind of nightmare. My email chimed, ah, letting me know I just received a new message. My palms had begun to sweat. I quickly kicked, clicked the inbox tray. It was a message from that auction site, letting me know that I made the winning bid. My heart started beating faster. I hadn't made any bids. I wanted to delete that email right then and there, but I felt like even if I did, this creepy stuff was still going to keep happening, feeling like I had no other choice. I opened the email. The item I'd won was a Polaroid camera. It was the same make and model that I'd given to him. Then I saw the sender's name. I felt like I could hardly breathe. I looked away from the screen. It was insane. The time that the camera had been put up for auction was the same time that he had died. Several days later, the Polaroid camera was delivered to me. I couldn't get the words I saw on the auction site out of my head. No refunds. No returns. Squelch? Squelchy noises? Was like the camera filled with blood or something? The end. Wow. What a... What a shame. We bought a camera for the sake of taking pictures of girls, because girls hate it when you take pictures with digital cameras. So we had to, had to use a physical camera. What do you know? Ghost in the camera. That's how they get you. And then the ghost in the camera killed our friend with a car accident. And then it came back to us. The camera came back to us. I mean, I guess we don't actually have to use it, right? Like, if you just don't use it, then would anything happen? You could just, like, put it in a cabinet or something. I mean, we should see what happens if we make the other choice. So, we made the choice to stop the friend from taking the picture. But we also had the choice to turn around, because we felt like there was someone behind us. Well, we gotta see what happens. I like how they have this backstory of why we're buying an antique Polaroid camera. Since we already have, you know, actual cameras. Modern cameras. But there's a reason we needed this one in particular. Okay. So... We gotta turn around, because we feel something behind us. Ah! I turned- the moment I turned around, the flash went off! There wasn't anybody behind me. I took another look at him, and I saw the photograph slowly come out. He held the still white photo in his thumb and flapped it back and forth through the air. After a while, he must have figured he'd shaken it enough, and he set the picture down so we could both see it. He squinted at the picture, and all of the color seemed to drain out of his face. Hey! What gives? He thrust the photo at me. It was still white. Seeing that I was puzzled by his reaction, he started to yell at me. You don't see it? I responded honestly, shaking my head no. He threw aside the camera and the photo. 
After that, with a pale expression on his face, he started getting ready to leave. What's wrong? I asked him, but all he did was mutter to himself. Before long, he was out the door. I stood there, dumbfounded by what had just happened, looking at the camera and the picture that he left behind. I double-checked it, and there was still nothing in the photo. Several days later, I got a call from one of my other classmates telling me that he'd been hit by a car. <laughs> that, you know, no matter how much we change the timeline, the timeline always has to end with him getting hit by a car. <laughs> and it all happened so suddenly that the reality of it hadn't sunk in for me, even after the funeral. Once I got home, though, I remember the photo, and it got me curious. He looked so disturbed back then. What in the world could he have seen in that photo? I'd stuck the photo and the camera into a drawer. I dug through all the junk in there and finally found the... I mean, how much junk is in there? If you had to dig through it to find a uh, whole-ass Polaroid camera. I took a deep breath and looked at the photo. Ah! In the photo, I could see that I had turned away. I was looking away from the camera, but my classmate was there in the picture. He was standing right in my line of sight, staring blankly forward at the camera. My body tensed up and I could feel myself breaking into a cold sweat. I couldn't bring myself to look at the corner of the room where my classmate was, there in the photo. All I wanted at that point was a way to make the camera and the photo disappear. My hands trembled as I tried to quickly gra grab the camera and stick it back into its cardboard box. <gasps> but the palms of my hands had become sweaty. They'll do that, causing me to almost drop the camera. I fumbled to grab it, and at that moment, I heard the shutter click. The camera was pointed at a bare wall. No, I hadn't taken that photo on purpose. The camera spit a white photograph onto the table. I didn't want to look at it, but at the same time, I couldn't look away. The image in the picture slowly became visible. Slowly. Very slowly. Is that us? Well, okay, all right, we were murdered by the photo. Well, I mean, either way, our friend dies by getting hit by a car. Can't stop that from happening. Um, the only thing we can stop is whether... I mean, in one ending, we get the camera back. But in the other ending, um, we still have the camera. I mean, we, we might potentially die in both of them. I don't know if we actually would survive uh, either of these endings. It's hard to say. So I guess the way the camera works is if you take a photo, that means you're going to die. I mean, I wasn't really sure if we were going for the person taking the photo was going to die or the person whose photo was taken is going to die. But it seems like we're going with it's the person who's who's using the camera. And we accidentally, like, we were fumbling with the camera because of our sweaty hands. And, uh, because of that, we accidentally took a photo. Which, which dooms us. This, I'm guessing is how this works. But that's no refunds, no returns. I can't believe that email vanished. That email wasn't deleted. It vanished as if it never existed. The email from that website, you know, the usual website where we bought the camera. Well, what about tail three? We've been very scared. We've our spines have been chilled so far. Bones tingled. What about tail three? The next person. Let's begin. Huh. I felt really bad having just been pulled out of a dream. I still felt kind of out of it. Oh, give me a break. I rolled over and pressed my pillow against my ears. Footsteps? 
It took me a few minutes to realize that what had woke me up was the sound of footsteps from the floor above me. Since I had been woken up while having a dream, I guess my mind wasn't exactly sharp right now. I pulled the covers over my head and cussed them out. What time did they think it was? Did they know why I chose this place? It has reinforced concrete walls. I'm tired. Let me sleep. So is, is he just like in his bed yelling curses at his ceiling is I guess what's happening. My ple- my plez? No, ple- would you- pre yeah, you'd pronounce- you'd spell please like that. Plea and then an S, yeah. My pleas went callously unheard. Callously! And the pa pace of the footsteps were thumping along at a constant rhythm. The footsteps were too light to be an adult. It was probably a kid. They never stomped around like this before, though. Did the person who lived in the floor above me invite a young relative over? At first, I thought of heading up there to complain. I didn't want to get caught up in any sort of trouble. I figured if the kid was stomping around because they couldn't sleep, it'd only be a matter of time before things got quiet again. My prediction turned out to be incorrect. The shower of footsteps continued until the morning. The same thing happened the next day and the day after that. The footsteps would start up in the middle of the night, like clockwork. I was getting less and less sleep with each passing day. My patience was starting to wear thin. On the morning of the fourth day, I finally called the company that manages the apartment. The phone rang for a long time until one of the managers finally picked up. I told him about the trouble I was having and how I couldn't get enough sleep. Ah, oh, sounds like we're gonna have another, another resident leave the apartment in the middle of the night then. Hearing the manager respond as though he couldn't do anything about it disarmed me. I asked him if he could explain himself and he told me about the situation. My apartment number was 604. All of the renters in the floors above me had gone missing, one after another. It started three months ago with apartment 1004. Weeks later, the same thing happened in apartment 904, and then apartment 804. It must be infectious, uh, this desire to just up and leave in the middle of the night. My manager gave me a dramatic sigh. Yeah. But I'm the one who has to deal with the fact that the delinquent on the payments. He said this as if he wanted my sympathy. What, did he expect me to just sit here and commiserate with him? He wasn't going to get any sympathy from me. At least three people had gone, over, had gone missing right over my head. Anybody with a lick of common sense would realize that something funny was going on here. I wanted to move out, of course. But... Even if I wanted to move, I couldn't just move out that very second. I couldn't tell the manager that I was planning to move out either. It was going to take time and money. I hadn't saved up enough money to move, naturally. In the end, I told him that I'd be cautious and hope for the best. And then I reluctantly hung up the phone. There they go again. It had been three days since I talked to the manager, and the footsteps had continued as usual. I couldn't stand it anymore. I made up my mind. I was heading upstairs myself. I kept ringing the doorbell until the door finally unlocked. With the door chain still set in place. A man in his thirties looked out at me with sunken eyes. It's the middle of the night. Do you need something? He sounded irritated with me. Oh, I live on the floor below you, and every day you keep stomping around, making so much noise. The man looked at me suspiciously, like he was trying to size me up. I gave an exasperated sigh. <sighs> Tell your kid to behave at least, I shouted at the man. I'm the only one who lives here, 
he said. And with that, he shut the door. Wait, open up. I continued ringing the doorbell, but the man wouldn't open the door back up. Worried I might attract the attention of the other people on the floor, I backed off and headed back downstairs. I returned to my room, turned off the lights, and tried to go back to sleep. Then the footsteps started up again. They were as annoying as ever, but today there was also something eerie about them and sinister. If that man really doesn't know anything about the footsteps, then what exactly was causing them? I tried to cover my ears, but I could still hear them. It seemed to me like the footsteps were coming closer. I could hear them again today. I don't know how many days it's been at this point. My head felt like it was spinning. It felt funny, like I was drunk. And maybe it was a sleep deprivation doing this to me. I tried going back to apartment 704 many times after that, but I was never able to meet up with the man who was there again. His mailbox was overflowing with newspapers. Maybe he went on a trip, or maybe he went missing like the others. Either way, whose footsteps were they? I've been a nervous wreck lately, and I'm guessing it's because I haven't been getting enough sleep. On my way home from work, I saw crows standing on the roof of the apartment. They creeped me out with all of their cawing. Where did the people who went missing end up going? For some reason, the crows had been flocking around the water storage tank. A disgusting thought ran through my head. I tried talking to a friend of mine about it, but he told me I just needed to get some rest. Maybe my friend is right, I thought. And maybe this is just in my head after all. I should go and tell a doctor about everything. Maybe the doctor can prescribe me some medication that'll help me get some sleep. Those were the thoughts I had as I started to nod off, until a droplet of water struck my forehead. I looked up to the ceiling and saw a stain that had spread all the way to the wallpaper. Droplets of water had been forming on the ceiling, and they had begun to drop right down onto my bedsheets. Was water leaking down from the room above me? And then I remembered I hadn't heard any footsteps. The water wasn't stopping. It continued to fall, drop by drop. I tried calling the manager, but it was the middle of the night, so there was no way he was going to pick up. Had the man in apartment 704 returned? Or was it something else? I was lost about what to do. Uh oh okay, now we have a choice. Do we visit apartment 704, or, you know, just move our futon away from the drops? Look. We possibly have a uh, supernatural goings-on in the apartment above us. Uh, so, uh, ho horrific ghostly water is dripping down. Um, I think that we need to do the, the practical thing. Move our futon away from the drops, uh, just try to get some sleep, and then maybe call the manager in the morning to say it's no longer footsteps, but, uh, I think, you know, a, the, the apartment above me may be flooding. You should probably look at that. It's probably the plan. I took the futon off of my bed and moved it to a place on the carpet where it wouldn't get wet, so I could sleep there. I put a big bowl in its place to catch the water that was falling. There you go. Catch that water. With the footsteps gone, I was able to fall asleep right away. Hmm. I felt really bad, having just been pulled out of a dream. I still felt kind of out of it. Who could it be at this hour? I was barely able to open my eyes and look through the keyhole. A guy with disheveled hair who looked like he was a college student was standing outside the door. Feeling cautious, I left the door chain in place and I opened the door. Every single day you've been stomping around your room up here. You've been keeping me up at night. The very second I opened the door, the guy started throwing a fit at me. I didn't know what he was talking about. You got a kid here, don't you? I keep hearing their footsteps. Put them to bed already. I shook my head no. There weren't any kids in, in my apartment. Creeped out by the guy, I shut the door. 
I felt something tug at my sleeve. Cold line of sweat ran down my back. There was something behind me, but I couldn't make myself turn around and face it. I could feel water seeping into my clothes from the spot where I'd been grabbed. Come on, let's play! Ah! The end. Child wants to play with us. The wet child. The, the soaking wet child wants to play, and he's just going through each floor. Okay, now he's gone through room- uh, he's gone through 604. I guess he's now- he's, ne next time he's gonna go through 504. Eventually he's gonna get to the first floor. Uh, he's gonna run out of people to play with. Um, alright, so. Turns out, this whole time, the person below us was hearing footsteps while we were hearing footsteps from above us. You know, this is just a story about how communication would have solved this problem if everyone just communicated with each other before we got to the point where the the wet child was ready to murder us. Maybe we could have avoided this whole situation. Maybe we could have. Uh, but of course, there was something else we could have done. We could have gone up... Instead of moving the futon, we could have gone up to the floor above us. Presumably, the guy above us would already be dead. If uh, this just happens the same pattern every time, then I guess the, the wet child would have killed him shortly after we spoke to the upstairs neighbor. Um, so, I guess we should go up there now and see what we find. I mean, I do always agree with procrastinating as long as possible, but it looks like if we do that, the wet child will just kill us. Sometimes procrastination doesn't work. Now he's suspicious. He doesn't know what we're talking about. He's the one who's, has, who's had the deal with someone stomping around above him. He can't get to sleep. He's not been stomping around. Okay, here we go. All right, let's go up to apartment 704. Talk to our upstairs neighbor who is dead about his wet apartment. I didn't feel right about staying where I was. I quickly put on a jumper and climbed up the stairs. When I arrived at apartment 704, I rang the doorbell, just like I did the last time. After ringing the doorbell for the second time, I could hear the door unlock. So there really was someone in apartment 704? I felt a wave of relief pass over me. The door had opened just a crack. The door chain didn't appear to have been set. I waited for the man to show up, but it remained quiet in the apartment. I took a peek through the gap in the door, and I couldn't see anybody inside. The sense of hesitation inside of me was getting bigger and bigger. Still, I couldn't just ignore what was going on here. The water was dripping down into my own apartment after all. I tried to keep my trembling hands steady as I turn the doorknob. I open the door slowly. I heard the sound of water coming from a room in the apartment. The bathroom. I tried to flip the switch to turn the lights on, but they still didn't turn on. My heart was pounding so loud, I could hear it. I asked myself, Self, should I just head back? No. I'd already come this far. It was too late to turn back. I moved forward, guided by what little light there was, and opened the door to the shower. <gasps> there was a kid inside. I felt my pulse race, but I managed to calmly ask the boy a question. Hey, little guy, where'd the man who lives here go? The kid stared at me. 
Hey, he went somewhere else. They all did. His voice was muffled, and it echoed as if it was bubbling up from deep under the water. I took another look at the kid, and I saw that there were drops of water falling from his hair. No, I'm so easy here, mister. I got goosebumps. I tried to turn away and run, but then I felt someone grab my hand from behind. The hand was sticky and wet. Well, Tuesday evening, huh? My feet started sinking into the floor. It was like my feet had gotten stuck in a marsh. I couldn't pull them out. Oh, we're going to be together forever now, aren't we? The lukewarm water slowly started working its way inside of my body. The end. All right, we end up we end up a wet boy ourselves in both endings. It's just that in this one, uh, you know, we go up to the apartment ourselves, and I guess that means that when the kid comes down to uh, floor six, he's not going to find anyone there. He's going to be like, "Oh, well, I, I guess that was the guy from last night. Is there no one here now?" And then he's going to say, oh, I guess I'm going to have to go without someone uh, tonight. And the next night, go down to 504. All right. Those are our three stories. We've seen uh, both options for both for all three. Unfortunately, that did not unlock a final fourth story where we have to deal with elevator woman, haunted camera and wet boy at the same time. Could we possibly overcome the challenge of all three at the same time? Probably not. Probably not. Well, that's the Haunted Zone. Uh, as I said, this was one of the games that came with FromSoft's Adventure Player. So, you know, you want to make like a little text adventure of yourself. Your, I mean, is it really a text adventure? Like, you, there's like one choice. There's one choice. Um, like, obviously, this is not as big of a, a thing as the Echo Night game. I guess, like, you, you could have made a text adventure with more choices uh, with this thing, though. The, the spooky stories are pretty, pretty spooky. They're pretty haunted. Um, I still think that for the cramped elevator... A spookier story would have been to get in an, an ele elevator where there are just way too many people and then the elevator breaks and you're stuck in there with them. Like, that's probably is going to be... I would like that more. Um, or, like, the next person. That could just be a story about your, your apartment's flooding and you can't get the manager to do anything about it and you don't have the money to move out. That's just real. That's just realistic horror. That's just real. Oh, no. I'm getting sick because of all the moisture in my apartment, and I can't get the landlord to do anything. Um, a more realistic version of no refunds, no returns would, I guess, just be that the camera doesn't work. And I mean, no refund. You can't return it. You can't return it. You should have thought better before buying that one. Like, the, per the person selling it did not have a sales history. And they say that you cannot return it and get a refund. So, that's just a warning sign right there. That's a red flag. But, uh, those are our three stories in the Haunted Zone. A little, a little from soft, spooky horror to tell around... I was about to say the campfire, but I guess not the campfire. To tell around the illumination of the PSP... You could like hold the PSP under your face to to light it up from underneath to be scary while you tell your friends about the story about buying the camera from eBay so you could take pictures of girls. But oh no, there's a ghost in it. There's a ghost in the camera. I mean, it doesn't have to be like an antique camera for that, you know. It could just be like today you could have a story where it's just like, oh no, there's a ghost in my phone. He's, he's deleting all of my photos. No, don't delete my apps. Not my bookmarks. I did not take creepy pictures 
of the people around me. That's the ghost in my phone doing it. Stop it, please. Look, I would like to upgrade my phone, but I mean, I can't afford it. Phones are expensive, so I'm kind of stuck with this one, despite the ghost who lives in my phone. No, oh no, he's, my, the ghost in my phone is logging into X. No, he's subscribing for X Blue. Don't add Elon Musk and say, what, and, and compliment him. No, the ghost, the ghost is doing this. Oh no! See, this is modern horror. This is this is something that is relevant to our concerns in the modern day. What happens when the thing that you use all the time uh, gets taken over by a ghost and no one believes you because that's dumb? I know, right? Think about it. Think about it. <laughs> well... That's The Haunted Zone. I hope you enjoyed. Some little little text horrors. Not a big thing. Like none of the none of these adventure game adventure soft venture adventure player things are quite big. But uh this one and Echo Knight were the only two ones that have a, a fan English translation, as far as I know. I don't think the uh, uh there was a third game that came with it, and then there were others that were available for download from FromSoft's website. But I don't think those have English translations. So, it could be interesting to take a look at them if they ever do get translations. But, it's only these two for the time being. Just a little curiosity that I wanted to check out. Um, that's been The Haunted Zone from FromSoft's Adventure Player on the PlayStation Portable.